This episode of the Out of Spec Podcast was brought to you by Magna. Magna is a leading edge mobility technology company for automakers, and it supplies automotive systems, assemblies, modules, and components to countless brands you've undoubtedly heard of. GM, Ford, BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, and so many more. Magna has been a key player behind the scenes for decades, including pioneering some of the first reverse cameras before you had even heard of the concept. They now look to the future with fully autonomous driving systems, ADAS, and many electric car components for your EV at home. We'd like to thank our sponsors that make shows like this possible. Hey, welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. We've got Kyle, Ben, Mike, and myself, Jordan, here to Fill your ear with some car things, EVs galore, and oh, uh, locking differentials, and hydrogen, and selling cars, um, surprisingly. So let's jump right in. Uh, I don't even know where to start. We have a lot of ground to cover. Oh, and ADAS. We're going to talk about um, Mm -hmm. driver assistance systems and how incredibly wide they vary. And the results may shock you. (laughs) So stay tuned. Um, first, let me just let's let's just get it out of the way. We've talked previously on the show about Kyle's Tesla and the possibility of selling it, despite its condition, which is actually pretty good condition, um, con- all things considered. I mean, I did a big video, kind of doing a light. I don't even want to call it detail; just a deep clean. <laughs> And it cleaned up better than I expected. Um, but Kyle was like entertaining offers from various vendors and finally found one he was interested in. Well, it started with, I'm going to keep this car forever because it's not worth anything. I was yeah. like, you know, it's going to be worth 25 grand. It's a 2019 Tesla Model 3 performance with 100 and now 10,000 miles as near as makes no difference. And it's like, who wants that? That's like a you know four-year-old iPhone at this point. It's going to be worth nothing. And then like I was browsing through a fa- Facebook forum and some in the Mach E group actually. And someone's like, I just sold my Mach E for like way more than it's worth to this one company. I'm like, oh my God, let me go see what my car's worth. And then they hit me with 41 grand, which is like astronomical <laughs> considering, you know, the amount of mileage on this car. And, you know, in comparison, that's 10, $20,000 more, almost twice as much as what other vendors were going to give me after looking into it. I'm like, well, I have no real need to sell this car. I have no real need to keep it. I guess if it's that strong money, I should just dump it. Mm -hmm. This is the most you'll ever get for it. (laughs) So the process has been lengthy and, you know, if it doesn't go through, I don't really care. I'll just keep it. But, um, essentially they, they like said they were all backed up. It would take all this while to get paperwork. And I'm like, ah, this is sound, kind of sounds like a scam. And then, you know, did some research into them. They're owned by one of the largest automotive companies in the country. Uh, they're no joke. And uh, they're sending me out the paperwork and, and they overnighted it to me. And I just have to sign a thing that says now the car's yours. Wow. And then they just write me a check wow. for it. Or they just actually direct deposit it to my account. They don't even write me a check. So I can't believe wait. you're getting that much for it. Because when I sold my Model 3, which I bought within weeks of your Model 3 performance, both are performances, mine's a stealth, but I don't think that matters resale value-wise. No. Uh, I had 27,000 miles, and it was only worth 51. Right. So you can drive like four times the mileage or more, <laughs> and it costs you nothing. Yeah, almost nothing. Wow. So Kyle, uh, when you like, do you have to sign this thing and then overnight it back to them? And then do they just come pick up the car? So at that point you can't drive it anymore. I'm assuming if you had to drive it. Right. So right now, because I haven't actually signed it yet, I'm just looking, um, here's the text message chain of everything going through. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they said, basically, um, you know, as soon as I sign that paperwork, I can't drive the car anymore. Okay, that makes sense. I was just curious if that was the case. And so I haven't um, signed it yet because there's one last test I need to do with it tomorrow, and then I'm going to sign it tomorrow night and overnight it back to them. Then they said within like three days I should have the money, and then someone will get it at some point. Just uh, be sure before you sell it that you go into your account on the car and then reset the car and log out of your sure. account. Yeah, so you they, have to do, I was just going to say do that before yeah. you like log out of your Tesla account. Right. Well, they said um, uh, once they receive the paperwork back, we need you to do a factory reset on the car. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So they're mm -hmm. aware of it then. So that means hopefully whoever comes to fix it up actually checks to make sure people do reset. Why the is that such a big deal? Uh, because for the next owner or even for this company to have the car in their possession, they won't be able to do anything with the car. So the next owner, you will have to log out of that vehicle for them to get it into their app. You mean so for the Tesla stuff? To make your, yeah, to have your own Tesla account, yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, I, I think they've got that figured out pretty well. And, and for so, supercharging. You know, I guess I'll, I'll just send them, a, yeah, I'll send them a picture that shows I'm logging out, send a little clip, and we'll put it all on YouTube and document it and can't wait to share that story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you sad? You've been through a lot together. <laughs> not even in, in the slightest. I've never bonded with a Tesla. To me, they're iPhones yeah. on wheels. They're not emotional devices. I've True. never connected with one. Yep. I, I love them. Don't get me wrong. I would buy another Tesla in a heartbeat. I followed, I was following a black on white model S plaid, my perfect spec Ooh. in LA yesterday. And I was like, Oh my God, that thing is hot. And he had it slammed and it looked great. And so I was, yeah, I, I, I love them, but to me, they're just uh, devices that are, have, it's like a washing machine. Yeah. yeah. Really, really fast. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, love it, but but no emotional connection. That's part of why I like them so much. I can just beat the crap out of them, have no issue with anything, and then uh, you know get another one or sell it. True. Um, and then Mike and Ben, are you selling your car too? Sold the car. Well, sold. Yeah. Sold. Go on. I'll let Ben tell the uh, tell the actual story because it was basically his uh, doing to get it set up. Yeah. Uh, so. We had our 2008 Boxster, which was a replacement of the 911 because we missed having three pedals and a flat six in the garage pretty quickly. Uh, and now it's been two weeks or maybe not even, and we already then miss now having a flat six and three pedals in the garage. So, <laughs> you know, like- it Didn't take long. There will be, yeah, there'll probably be another thing. We literally have already tried to buy another car at this point. Um, and so, I went to the dealer and I just said, Hey, would you put it on consignment in the showroom? Cause it's like the lowest mileage, one of these out there, very clean. And so we ran it through PPI. They put it in the showroom right out front. It sold within an hour and a half on Saturday morning of it being inside. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and you got all the money for it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like 30, it sold for 32,000, which is quite good. Uh, wow. And the new owners are in love with it. Cause it's probably the nicest 2008 Boxster that exists, I would think, or it's one of the Boxster nicest. S or just a Boxster? The base, the nice. purest spec. As well. <laughs> the driver's choice. <laughs> I, it honestly, also had no, no over revs in its history, so cleanest, it was never taken to actually, the Actually, the technician said it was the cleanest over report he ever had seen in his life. Really? <laughs> he wow. said, this thing's a cream puff. The only thing it had was stage one, which is when you touch red line. So it's not really over revving. Um, right. And it had done like, I think, eight revolutions of the engine there. <laughs> and he's so like, sure. that's not. And someone did that in the last like 30 hours of operation. I was right. like, Ooh, that was yep. me. <laughs> 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 but uh, great little car. In fact, uh, anyone who, this is what I would tell anyone who's shopping, especially if you're looking for a Porsche, Cayman, Boxster, 911, doesn't really matter. Don't get so hung up on the S because the base is a ton of fun. Short yep. gearing on those cars. It, it doesn't need to be fast. You're driving on the street. Who cares? You're not trying to win. You're not going to win the drag race in the S anyways. It's Might as well just save some money and have some fun. Listen to good noises. Yeah, I agree. Although I remember distinctly years ago, you and I test driving. I, I remember that. 2008 yes. The Boxster and us going, this is way too slow. Only <laughs> idiot would buy this. <laughs> yes, yeah, we did. Uh, although at that time I was trying to find it. We were both in the, uh, uh, like, uh, we're both sitting with this concept of we both need faster cars, right. which that, that was not, not doing. Fast. Handling wasn't relevant to us at that point. We were like, horsepower was the only thing that mattered. Well, that's what happens when you live in the South. You need V8s or nothing, baby. Mm -hmm. The um, That one that you guys test drove that, couple, uh, that number of years ago, that one did not have the Porsche Sport exhaust on it, I bet. Because if it did, I think Ben would have bought it. I would have bought it because I just <laughs> drove a 2016 16 base boxer with Porsche sports exhaust. And when I tell you, this is the best sounding car I've heard in my life. I mean it. Really? Oh, I'm incredible. tempted to buy it. Like I've been thinking about yes. buying this car for like two weeks now. <laughs> wow. Because it sounds that good. It's, it's slow, amazing. but it's all bite. No, wait, all bark and no bite. 
You get to enjoy but it doesn't the matter longer. because oh yes, yeah. yeah, and it does all the crackles and overrev noises and the little burbles and yep. It ha- a two point seven liter engine does not deserve to sound that good. It's really amazing, actually, <laughs> and it goes to show that like when you actually like buy the Porsche equipped exhaust from the factory, it's better because you get the tuning in the programming in the engine that then makes those sounds all the much better. Really. So on the Taycan, I should spec the sports exhaust. You should. I regret not doing the Porsche Sport sound. I think it's no, silly and fun. No, get out of here. Then, yeah, that, no, I kind of wish we had it. Here, here uh, I'm going to just, anyone who's considering Taycan, you know what? Just get it. It's 500 bucks. Me. And if you want to do it after the fact, it's like three grand. So Let me point out, the it. GTS has a unique sport uh, yes. like sound, which is the one you want, Kyle, right? And no. it's better. That's <laughs> no. That's all dumb. Sorry. No, it's it's you fantastic. It. It's no, the best fake all, sound I've yeah. ever heard. At least it's, it's representative. A no, the nice thing about it is at least they're emulating real sounds that the car makes, mm-hmm. but it's not making that sound anyway. So I don't want it but, amplified. Technically, it's but not it emulated. Flips the downshifts. That's so dumb. That's the best part <laughs> of it. Technically, That's it's so not dumb. emulated. It is an actual recording of the actual Porsche it's motor. True. Yeah, I don't want it. any of that. <laughs> I'll turn it off. Yeah, but spec no, it for spec it. No, I'm not specking it. I'm <laughs> de-specking it. Even if they charge me a thousand dollars to take it off the car, I'm taking it. <laughs> yeah, don't install. Well, uh, we should talk about Rogers. the elephant in the room because I'm dying to know about your experience in um, California this past weekend, Kyle, because you drove. The BZ4X, which we didn't give a glowing review, although it wasn't a review. It was a walk around and initial reaction to the car at, what was that, Chicago? Yeah. And now you actually went out and drove it. So there you are with Newcomb's Ranch for our uh, visual listeners, watchers on YouTube. Um, (laughs) Yeah. What do you think? So unbelievably interesting. Ah, nice. Interesting. All right. Now I'm into <laughs> because that's not the take I had on the more it's I've not a on this car. Everyone thought the it was be, a bit rough. Everyone thought it was going to be total hot garbage. Yeah. It's not. Not all of it, right? Some of it is <laughs> the hottest garbage I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was about to touch on. <laughs> Some of it is really well, we'll good. get there. So okay. Let's start at the initial favorite reaction. things. My favorite things. thing, you know, yeah. I first off asked Toyota because we also had a Mirai this weekend, so we had BZ4X and Mirai. And not all the videos have gone up, but if you listen to our podcast, you'll get all the sneak stuff here. So for those listening, you'll know the BZ4X. I asked Toyota, "Hey, can you deliver the Mirai and the BZ4X to the airport so when we fly, we just get in cars?" They, you know, that's just the, what we do when we go to LA, and no problem. And I was like, don't charge or fill them. Like just whatever they're at, just bring them over there. Because part of our coverage is knowing about the infrastructure and the charging times, especially with hydrogen. I've never filled with hydrogen before. So anyway, BZ4X, we get it. It's about 40, 50% state of charge and like actually shows like well over 100 miles of range remaining. And I know how these delivery drivers drive. And I'm like, well, that seems mildly impressive like it's epa range rated at 222 i thought it was going to be horribly inefficient it wasn't horribly inefficient at higher speeds it was but i never actually got to do a range test and i'll get to why later on so uh (laughs) driving it drives just like a rav4 prime but better it's snappy it's relatively quick the steering's good it's the right size everything feels like it's built really well the ui actually isn't that bad and like cruising around it has great driver assistance and some people will only buy a toyota like a surprising number of people are just toyota people mm-hmm. and if or they're the people. out of a combustion rav4 or rav4 prime or a camry or whatever they've been driving a 1994 corolla and they get into this it's going to feel like the future to them because it is probably the best driving toyota aside from their sports car stuff ever um you know, zero to 60 in seven seconds or something like that doesn't represent the acceleration feeling you get off the line. Like it makes pretty much the same power as a rear wheel drive ID for 10 kilowatts more. And it feels so much more sprightly than that off the line. Mm-hmm. And so it's geared from like zero to 50. The thing's a rocket ship. Like, you know, it's not a plaid, but like more than you would think for a Toyota <laughs> electric car. 
And a lot of people in, in our viewership world hate Toyota, like genuinely hate the company. I, and I think it's purely because of all their anti-EV ads and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And, and yeah. in the US, we haven't really had the anti-EV stuff as much as the UK ad people have, you know, the uh, self-charging hybrid campaign. I don't think we ever had that here in the US. But anyway, I don't really care about companies. I just want to review the car. So that plays no impact into my coverage. It's just, you know, how is the car and and very try to be objective about it. And it's good. Drives great. Good acceleration. Great room. It's basically a RAV4 electric that everyone's been asking for. They should have called it the RAV4 electric. Here's where it You're gets right. really bad. Like really bad. And I mean, <laughs> the really, hottest of garbage. <laughs> really, really, really bad. Ben, what is the longest charging time you've ever heard of on an electric car from zero to full? From zero to full? Uh, hour and 45 minutes, maybe? I think Mach E might take the cake at two hours 30 on the old software. Oh, is it that bad? Oh, you make the full, full, full? Like I mean, 100%? 100%. Oh, yeah. Two hours was, I didn't even think, I was going to say the Mach E, but I didn't think it was actually over two hours. Two hours 30 on the Mach E. Oh, this <laughs> over oh. well over five hours. Oh, oh <laughs> you waited that? five hours. I kid you not. I was there till three o'clock in the morning charging this thing before I got annoyed at just sitting at 99% for 45 minutes before I left. Oh my God. <laughs> DC fast charging. Mind you, this is not like level not two yet. at a dealer. Like this is, you know what I want to know is <laughs> it, we're charging at one kilowatt at 95% on a DC yeah. fast charger. If you plug it into a level two, is it going to do one kilowatt? That's what I want to know. But I actually ran out of time because I spent my entire week in the <laughs> charger. <laughs> That's all you did. Yeah. Oh my God. So like when I do a range test on this thing, I'm going to at night, throw it on the DC charger where I have to do it, wake up in the morning, get breakfast, work, get lunch. Then it might be done. And then I can mm-hmm. do the range test. Because my plan was, as normal, is I do the charging test to 100%, and then I do the range test because I'm already at 100. Like, that's the perfect time. Batteries are warm. We're ready to go. Uh, I got to the charger. I timed it just as the sun went down around 7.30, 8 o'clock p.m., and I was like, great, I'll charge it for – I knew it wasn't going to be great. I figured an hour and a half, two hours at worst um, because they claim a 100-kilowatt peak rate. I saw a peak of 86 kilowatts multiple times on multiple chargers trying to figure out why I couldn't get the 100. 86 or 87 kilowatts is the maximum. Uh, And it goes exactly one hour, two minutes, I think, from zero to 80%. So it's not the worst thing on it. But it's like compared to a Bolt, like, okay, maybe. I think it's actually worse than a Bolt when you factor in the curve. I haven't tested it. I mean, it's quite literally four times slower than like an Ionic 5. Well, that's the thing. It costs fifty-two grand for this car. Oh, wow! Yeah. Oh, how big is this battery oh. pack? Seventy-two kilowatt hours. So, at the same state of charge by Taycan, which I grant is a more expensive car, at like ninety percent, it's still pushing hundred kilowatts. Though. Yeah, but use Ionic Five because that's the same price as this car. Yeah. Okay, it's With still doing that as well. Pack. It can do <laughs> 200 kilowatts at 70% state of charge. This thing touches single digits at 80. <laughs> oh, my God. And Ooh, so this, on a road trip, mm. you've got to pull in so dead that it's unbelievable. And you got to charge it to the least amount of state of charge possible. Is it like 300 year. volts? 350? 350, yeah, 350 yeah. volts nominal. Um, just very disappointed. It's still unexcusably slow. And, you know, no one at Toyota, like, knows what's going on, right? So, like, they don't know if it's pre-production software, this, that, the other. And I'm like, well, you gave me a car. I told you what I was going to do with it. If it was on pre-production software, you probably should have told me. I'm going to post the video. Like, I don't know what, what else to say. Like, it, I thought the rest of the car was going to be terrible. Like, the rest of the car is awesome. really is. The car is great. It's got plenty of range, whatever. It feels nice. It looks pretty good in person, actually. Um, like I, I think it looked way better in person than it does online. I really enjoyed driving it to the point where like I was having fun in the canyons with it. Like I, And it was awesome off-road on a dirt road. We took it. It can lock axles, no problem. We put a video on out-of-spec overlanding. It, it has way better drivetrain control than a Rivian off-road. Wow. So some things are really good on the damn thing. And then... 
you go and charge it and it's like, holy shit, literally this is unbelievably <laughs> unbelievable how bad it is. And the thing is, so many first time owners are going to buy this car and this is what they're going to think every EV is like. Oh, that's mm -hmm. scary. And oh, I so, had one of those, but it was so long to charge. So I don't think EVs are good. Yeah. You, right. I can hear the conversations now. Also, think about charging station throughput, which is becoming a much bigger issue, which is yeah. lines at chargers. I cannot tell you how many EVs in California this weekend I saw charging to 100%. Tons. I was talking to some of them, too, because they, they, it's just normal cars in L.A., right? Like, people just buy them. Mm -hmm. they, they're not into cars. It's whatever. And they're like, oh, well, I thought that's just what you do. I'm like, well, no, you actually can shave, like, 40 minutes off your trip if you just stop twice and charge to 50% instead of stopping once and charging to a hundred and this guy in the id4 didn't understand he's like i do this trip once a week and i always do a hundred percent state of charge at this charger because that's what i need to make it and i'm like well i just pulled out a better route planner and i showed him how much time he would save because i had all the time in the world sitting at this charger and <laughs> yeah, you're there for five and a half hours you can do a lecture circuit yep and uh <laughs> i mean i could have gotten my doctorate degree sitting there and so <laughs> basically i like showed this guy and saved him you know 40 minutes a week just by him optimizing charging what is someone in a bz4x gonna do pick a new hobby uh, maybe they can start <laughs> like knitting Learn what a are you going to do for like media loans? This is what I don't understand. Automakers ask EVs to be dropped off as near as full to possible to journalists. Now, when we get cars, we say, you know, we're friends with all the fleet guys. We're like, just bring it up dead. We got plenty of charging. Like, don't waste your day. This is going to be an entire day of charging it to get it full for a journalist. Yeah. They're going to have to like mm -hmm. drop it off with a disclaimer. Must charge in your own time. <laughs> it's a better really question. Bad. Uh, first off, weird thing. The front wheel drive supposedly charges better than the all wheel drive. I dislike that whole premise, but I want to go back real quick to charging. How much did it cost to charge it for five hours at an Electrify America station? No different because they bill by the kilowatt hour. Oh my God, you're so lucky. <laughs> I know. You're so I lucky that you were in the state minute. with kilowatt yeah. hour billing and not by minute billing. <laughs> that would be so bad. What is, hang on, let's do some math here. Um, I don't actually is, know the full time it took to charge, but it might actually be more than what I'm saying. It's definitely not less. What is it per <laughs> minute on Electro America right now? Roughly, I don't know. Anything. No, is it like 40 is cents? it North Carolina per minute seat? Per minute makes a lot of sense for the fast charging cars. Yeah, the you, you five the great. Past. Let's let's do benefit of the doubt. Can you see on your app? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Anyway, it would cost <laughs> it. Oh, hang on, real quick. Let's just say 30 cents. <laughs> I just want to know. Um, I don't know what's not letting you go. By the minute. North Carolina is by the kilowatt hour now. Yeah, it is by the kilowatt hour. There are some that are by the minute, though. It could cost hundreds of dollars. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's I very possible. I, that's it, incredible. So, why is it that if you want all drive, you don't get to charge quickly? Yeah, that's the other thing. Kilo an hour. I don't know. So anyway, yeah, I don't know. look, for the most part, people who understand the car, people listening to the show are going to go zero to 80 and that takes an hour. And then you get some amount of mileage. I don't know because I didn't get to do a range test. What? Because I, I was stuck in the chart. Yeah. And it's not like I could leave early in order to do a range test. I need to be full. Fair. You should just start your rain chest right when it was done charging after being there for five hours. I never let it complete. I didn't. I didn't have. <laughs> oh, that's right. You never got to a hundred. <laughs> it just sat at ninety nine for the longest time, and I'm like, just finish. And so, <laughs> um, so you know, it could have been doing some sort of top balancing. It's possible the car's never made it to a full charge in its life before because it takes so long. And that so, would be interesting. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to test it again. I talked to some guys at Toyota today and they were, even they were like, Oh, that's not good. I'm like, yeah, it sucked. Yeah. Like, and, this sucks. And Toyota doesn't do software like over the air software updates. Do they They do now on this? Oh, okay. I was going to say, at least that's a good thing. So hopefully they can fix that. Or they'll say, knows, actually we're seeing faster than normal degradation. We're going to turn <laughs> it down. Like you never yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Hidden in there somewhere. So I think the 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 trade off of them lasting a long time is them not charging very fast. Okay, so that's for road trips. For most people who have a home and are going to charge there, doesn't matter. But yeah, like if you wanted to buy this over the mini, like I probably wouldn't. You could road trip the mini, but I don't plan to road trip. It the might mini be there. faster. It would yeah. be the same 
Uh, the Mini probably would be fast charging just for the size of the battery. Alone, I don't know but... about that. I think this would probably still beat the Mini. Because that 0 to 80 is not terrible. Really, 0 to 50 is not terrible. It's just this a like, higher, higher end. It's just like, so it starts off at 86 kilowatts, and then I took some pictures because I was just stunned. At 70, <laughs> I even unplugged and plugged back into another unit just to make sure I wasn't going crazy. But I, I double-checked after, too. 25 kilowatts at 73%. And it you know, um, half an hour mini. 84 kilowatts at 1%. So that's that's pretty much peak. And it just it just goes, I've never seen a charging curve that starts here and just, just takes a nosedive. But uh, back to my point, I think that this could be a good alternative for someone who doesn't want a mini or just needs more room. Like, because the typical, I think the typical Toyota buyer probably is not going to take this car on a lot of road trips in general. Most people don't road trip their EV, at least as frequently right. as, this, no, we might. This right. is a great city car, I think. I mean, as far as the range, like this is more than enough range for any yeah. city car. I can I see a lot of these it, in Raleigh, the Raleigh area, to be honest. You can't fault anyone for buying this car because there's yeah. a lot of Toyota people. It honestly drives really well. It's built, no question, of course, really well. The interior's tight, sound system's decent, not great, but like it's an okay car. The thing that I don't understand, though, is when you start looking at its competition. Now, it's sort of like a little bit like Tesla, where there's Tesla people that will only consider a Tesla, and I don't care what anyone else is doing. <laughs> that's a thing for Toyota people. And it's oh, just yeah. like they make an electric car. That's the one I'm going for. They're not going to be disappointed. It's just if you don't have access to home charging, do not buy this car. Don't yeah. ever plan to use a DC fast charger with it, basically. Yep. So the Mirai, is that a better experience? Oh, the Mirai is truly magical. And maybe I and, love it so much. And the, the Mirai is, is like, what, 20 grand more expensive? <laughs> uh, yeah, the Mirai was uh, $67,400 as tested. I forget they're that expensive because I just never think of them because I never see them. Right, because you don't live where you can own one. Yeah, I know. But I do love them. Like, I really... I personally want to drive one so bad. I was so jealous you got to go drive one. Mike, you would love it. I love I it know. because it's, first off, stunning to look at. That blue is amazing. Yeah. That's the spec. And yeah, I think this is the same car. Matt I love the big long hood thing, too. It's, it's, it's nice. a Lexus LS. It's built on the GAL yes. chassis, but shortened a little bit. and has. A but I thought the back was pretty tight, right? The back looks a little bit Nissan 300Z or the new Z. Yeah. It's got a little bit of that going on. Um, I just think it's awesome and drives so nice. I, we took it on a road trip to San Diego and back up and had to fill up a couple times throughout, you know, three different times over the weekend. We filled it up each time seamless, each time fast, four and a half minutes, zero to full. The infrastructure is still the major problem here. It's not the car. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, we mm -hmm. had to go on the app, see which hydrogen station had available uh, hydrogen that was compressed and ready to go. Thankfully, it just happened to work out where we were going. Um, and I, I really did enjoy the experience. It's not fast. Not everything needs to be fast. This is like a cruiser. And it. Yeah. What? here's an interesting observation. We saw a ton of people driving hydrogen cars around LA, especially at the filling stations, of course. Yeah. Now, I watched your video. I was surprised by how many Mirais and one Clarity pulled yep. in. And guess what? Only Asians. <laughs> is there is there massive hydrogen infrastructure in like asian regions or is this i don't know what where they buy here i don't I think know. it's a toyota thing and mm. i don't want to generalize based off of race but i will say like there were only asians not did one did you see guy. any hyundai what was the hyundai one hyundai Nexo. made a fuel cell car Exo. Nexo. Yes. yeah that's cool didn't see any nexos dang only like a million mirais and one clarity yeah. The Mirai is definitely the most popular hydrogen car. So and only saw one ever. other new Mirai. All of them were the last gens. I remember seeing I a lot they of bought last them gens when we were out there. Right? Even a few years ago, they were everywhere. So my understanding, we met, we talked to a few hydrogen. I asked everyone I saw, basically. Um, a couple people were like, yeah, the infrastructure kind of sucks. But like when it does work, it works pretty well. And they're like, I just check the app and sometimes run out in the middle of the night to fill up my car. Like, And then other people were like, literally never had an issue. It's been wonderful. Wow. <laughs> they must only go there like they hit the peak time, the off yeah. time every time. I don't know. So, you know, I've, I've actually only heard horror stories with hydrogen. I've never heard a positive one. I've never heard someone drove a hydrogen car 
and filled it and had a good experience. Well, it's like going to Costco to get gas. Yeah. You never go to Costco and get gas and have a good experience because you're always waiting in line. I only don't think I've ever done that. <laughs> a lot of people do. I see hmm. lines at Costco. Yeah, I see I the lines to. too. And I'm like, I just, I'm not hate, there. I just hate these stickers that are on I know. The alternate fuel Oh, EV yeah. cars in California. Hey, hey, you'll start loving that sticker as soon as you hit that HOV lane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, is, that is the best design attribute. And let me tell you, I took full advantage of that sticker. That's a good sticker. <laughs> that was By a, the way, that close up. That... Oh, we lost Mike. No, I saw him. Uh, oh, there oh you're go. Back. what were you, you saying? Out. I was saying in that close up, I thought that front end looked really good on the Murai. Yes. It's, it does. It's a good looking you know, car. Murai means future in Japanese. Oh, I really? Did. I did not. That's cool. Okay. So let's talk uh, hydrogen really quick. Love the car. Wait. First off, you can rev it, you were telling me. I need to know more yes. about that. That's amazing. If you're in park, you can put your foot down and then you hear it start sucking oxygen and it charges the battery. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's a non-mechanical system. So you just hear like air. Well, is there a blower well, for Well, there the air, is or? some mechanic. Yeah, because there's a supercharger, is what they call it, which forces oh. compressed air <laughs> yes. through, a, through a carbon filter and a PM 2.5 like HEPA filter thing mm -hmm. and cleans the air needed to make the chemical reactions because it has to be pure, pure. And it sounds like a turbocharger without an engine. So it goes, Ooh. And if you pop off the throttle, you hear a little blow off to buff, pop off the pressure. That's wow. kind of cool. That's cool. Although now I'm realizing that fuel cells require maintenance, like well, no, what air filters and whatnot. Yeah, I think you do need every you three need air years. filters. I think it's very minimal. Hmm. Probably not as bad as a normal car, but still more also, than an EV. Fuel cells are affected by altitude. Mm. Huh. Oh, so Colorado. Oh, yes, because yeah. the air... Oh, this is fascinating. Yeah, I know. You don't want to have a naturally aspirated fuel cell. <laughs> you need the supercharged one. <laughs> it's all... I, you know, I don't know why it's taken me so long to drive a fuel cell car. Maybe because I've just fallen into the hype that everything's really stupid and I hate this technology. And I'm not well, saying it's the superior technology to battery electric. It's fascinating stuff, though, to be able to play around with it. For some and people, it works, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, regardless if it's it works, it's still the most fascinating cool. powertrain, I think, right now, for someone like you or me to dig into and be like, how does this work? Because it's right. alien technology. Yes. It's really weird. It, it Like, I don't see any convenience gains to me over EV. Like, EVs charge no. pretty quick these days, and home charging's ideal, unless you can get a hydrogen station at home, which I don't think would be cost-effective. I don't but, think like, the fact that you can hear some noises that... Like maybe a hydrogen sports car could be kind of good. Like well, I would put up uh, that's what I was it up for that. So if so, you need uh, basically volumetric size. So you need a you need a lot of space for a tank. Mm -hmm. but you, if you replace an engine with a tank, uh, then then technically it would weigh less than a battery electric sports yeah. car, and in theory you could have more power. And so yeah. there could be performance applications for hydrogen. Now. Okay, let me get to the hydrogen thing really quick. By the way, before I do that, we have a hydrogen filling station literally right below me. It's right right outside over here. And it's the only one pretty much in the entire state of Colorado except for one other one. But it can do the full 700 or 70 megapascals, the full big boy charge. And it's here at our office. And it hasn't been turned on yet. We're waiting on the power company to commission it. I guess. But here's what I was thinking. Even though it's not the superior technology to battery electric, there is enough future coverage from our side of hydrogen trucks and hydrogen school buses mm -hmm. and medium and yes. heavy heat stuff that I was thinking we should buy a Mirai uh, or have Toyota loan us one for six months or a year if they would yeah. do that <clears throat> and live with it basically on a leash from our office. We'd have a 150 mile tether my house I'm right you should be commuting with it and the goal would be to pile as many miles on this thing in extreme temperature conditions under extreme elevation conditions and just figure out the real world limitations to the driver of hydrogen vehicles how yeah. does it do with very very cold temperatures i'd be wondering because yep. if you're if your em emission is water there's heaters everywhere freeze? yes oh, are there so it can only work to minus 30 degrees C, which is minus 22 F, which That's pretty good, can, 
in the mountains get that cold like one day a year. I would yeah. park the car up there on that coldest yes. day. That would be one of the <laughs> So it has a heated tailpipe or something, maybe? Or do you want to do you want me to go through the water situation? Let's, yes, wild. let's go through the water situation, please. Okay. I've never been more interested in an exhaust system in my life. <laughs> and, and I'm not claiming to be an expert. It's just I read the owner's manual over lunch and I think I figured out how it all works. So just casual. <laughs> right. Well, Alyssa hated it. We're like sitting out at this Mexican restaurant, like because when we when we, when she goes to a Mexican restaurant, we're like in a Mexican restaurant, like you know, <laughs> and and people are like looking at me reading this owner's manual like I'm crazy. Um, we're the only people that don't speak Spanish in there too. So like, what is with these people? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, so there's there's a couple of things to think about. Yes. So there's heaters all throughout to stop the water from freezing. Wow. There are a couple of considerations. First of all, there's an H2O purge button on the dash, which mm -hmm. just sounds awesome. And so it is cool. Feels like a submarine all, button. When you floor it, it does dump water. And Alyssa's like, every time you floor it, you're misting me. And like, that's hilarious. And I was driving up Angeles Crest and there was a motorcyclist behind me. I'm like, I wonder if I can cool him down on this hot day by hitting him with some water. Well, but I didn't do you remember do that. when we were in your mini in California and we, we thought this person was just spraying their windshield wipers like an absurd person. And we were, that was when we were following a Mariah, I think. It really? Was I don't remember that. The Honda one. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, remember we you ever like, telling you. Yeah, we thought it was like oil or we were told us, uh, and that's what was going on. It's just going down the highway, everyone behind you is getting little specks of water over their cars. That's so funny. So with the new Mirai, at least, it, it tries to store it all in the holding tank, but obviously at wide open throttle, it does purge some out. And I think like if you don't want to get your garage floor dirty, before you pull in, you can hit H2O purge, dump the water, pull in the garage, and have a clean, you know, non-wet floor, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and in the coldest of temperatures, they say you really don't have to do anything about it. But there are two scenarios where you need to do, I think it's called a full water evacuation. Oh, that's <laughs> a good name. Evacuation. What the heck? It's like and, escaping from a plane over the ocean. <laughs> yeah, the strip is sinking. And so the first is if you're in extremely they, I think they wrote Arctic conditions if you're in extremely mm -hmm. cold conditions and the vehicle is being pulled on a trailer, which means tons of airflow, which means maybe I'm thinking the heater couldn't keep up with it. That could freeze the water inside of the fuel cell stack. And so there's another situation too, which is if you leave it outside in the cold and you unhook the 12 volt battery because then the heaters would shut off, I guess. That's a very and weird so situation to be in. Right. So they said if you're in either of those two situations, <laughs> you, what you do is you hold the H2O purge button down, put the car in accessory power for 10 seconds, keep holding the H2O button down, foot on the brake, start the vehicle with the H2O button pressed. And then it does this 30 minute full water evacuation process and shuts off. Wow. 30 minutes. I think it's that long. Yes. For extreme. That's an extreme. That's why it's a, a evacuation. Yeah, I mean, you got to have, you know, keep your hands and feet inside the vehicle going down the slide. I, think. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that at some point Toyota must have been testing all these crazy situations this car could be in and what could jack up this hydrogen fuel cell. And those are the two. They're like, we can't have any water in the system for these two situations. And so that's truly fascinating. It is. Okay. So can I just talk about the negatives of hydrogen? Because I think that Absolutely. those are like the positives. It's really interesting. The car's funny. And I think we li I liked it so much because, first off, it's a luxury electric sedan when it boils down to it is how it drives, which Love is already. fine with me. And it handles pretty well. And it's definitely got like a little bit of a sportier edge than the LS. So like cruising up in the canyons, like it. It didn't love to be thrown around, but if you just progressively rolled into it, took a nice set, no understeer, really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and the steering was truly wonderful. So I like the fact that it drove so well had me going. It was pretty slow, but acceleration doesn't matter to me in some cars. And this is one of those. So here's the downside. With a hydrogen vehicle, you're taking electricity. You're then splitting water in an electrolyzer station, creating hydrogen, which then you have to compress as a hydrogen mm -hmm. gas, which then you have to rapidly cool to minus 40 degrees C or thereabouts. And then you have to fill into a vehicle, which then has to go through this entire process to combine with oxygen or to, to do, yeah, combine with oxygen to then just turn it right back into electricity. 
Not only that, you might have to transport it from the place that it's created to the station in some instances. Absolutely. And then there's a lot of dirty hydrogen. The majority of hydrogen is produced by natural gas and a few other byproducts. And it's very carbon intensive compared with a clean generation station. Now, our station at the office is an electrolyzer station that can be powered by solar, wind, hydro, uh, or just hooked up to the grid. So this is the cleanest form of hydrogen generation. The big question is, you're still spending more energy like your round trip efficiency is still less doing it this mm -hmm. way even though it's still clean like you could put it might that be six elsewhere you know six kilowatt hours to get one kilowatt hour of equivalent i don't think it's that energy. bad i think it's like i think someone said it takes 44 kilowatt hours to make one kilogram of hydrogen and that's 33 kilowatt hours worth of energy okay. so this is not as, as bad hit. Yeah, it's and not then the efficiency of the vehicle getting it out. You know, maybe that's yeah. 80, 90 percent, whatever it could but be. But for like passenger cars, it's like, well, just plug your EV into the wall and just take the energy yeah. and put it right into the thing. But then again, EVs need big battery packs that require a lot of natural resources and are a lot of weight and are heavy and expensive. Here you just have some tanks, which are not cheap because they're all carbon fiber reinforced polymer mm -hmm. line tanks and everything. Um, and, and it just doesn't seem to be the perfect technology for a passenger vehicle, especially considering all of the infrastructure, which is extremely expensive that has to go in and all of this. Now, not so saying is, easy or easy either. Is it more energy dense though? Like her weight, I'm sure it is. But yes, by the time it's in the vehicle, space and weight would be less than a battery electric vehicle. So maybe airplanes or something. You know, there's well, definitely that, some benefits to it, I can see. For, for, for aviation, sure. For medium and heavy duty trucking, definitely. Yeah. And that seems to be the, the real key component here is passenger cars, I think battery electric works. Now, like I said, if our hydrogen station gets turned on, I'm 100% in the market for a Mirai because I haven't even told you what they are used yet, by the way, sorry. This thing was there's 70 nothing. grand. Nears makes no difference. For a 2021 same model year with 1,200 miles was 24,000. Oh yeah. my god! Yeah, I was going to say they're like 24 to 30 grand. Yes, if you yeah. want a limited, they're 30 grand. I would spend the money and get the nice. I would too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Um, because then, like, wow, that's such a, a wonderful experience. 99% of my driving's local here in Colorado, or I'm flying somewhere. And I would be able to fill up just here at the office. And again, I want to I want to experience hydrogen, not for the sake of saying you should buy a passenger hydrogen vehicle, but for the sake of exploring the technology for mm -hmm. medium and heavy duty stuff. Because I can't realistically drive a semi truck to the airport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, you could, but it would not. I I, I wouldn't put it past you. I mean, I would try, but that's not something I'm going <laughs> to do. To do so, Kyle, time. what? What was like the range? Like, did you how how far could you go on a tank of hydrogen? So what's interesting is this one's rated at three hundred fifty three miles. It holds five and a half kilograms of hydrogen. The XLE, the base car, which only weighs seventy pounds less, got four hundred and two. That's a big wow. difference. So wheels? like that's more than just wheels. Yeah, but yeah. it's the same drivetrain. So they must be rated differently for some reason. There's also like a giant price disparity between XLE and Limited. And I don't know if Limited stands for limited range or just top trim. Because <laughs> <laughs> they have the same tank size and everything. I, I can't figure out why they're so different. My guess is in the real world, they're not that different. Mm. Probably not. That would make yeah. more sense. Yeah. So I just think the EPA rated them weird. I don't actually even know how they rate hydrogen range. I don't know how any of this stuff miles works. per gallon e, I guess. And, and then this is the funny thing. So it's a what a seventy megapascal tank. Yes. But some filling stations are thirty five, which means you yes. can only fill up to fifty percent on those stations, right? Yes. Which is kind of funny. I mean, it's really uh, it's like funny. imagine going to a gas station, and be like, oh, this gas pump can only give you half a tank. Right. And but you can't do it twice over sense. to get a full tank because it's a pressure thing. It right. makes sense, but it's interesting. I'm guessing all the ones that you encountered are. Can you fill a 35 car for 70 or would it just go pop? Oh, uh, no. You can use a 70 for anything. Oh, good. Okay. So, so all the new ones are 70. It's like an 800 volt charger at that point. Yes. And so basically any of the station, all of the stations we saw had a 70 component. I think it's just like the handful of really early stations have just H35. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but that's more, there's more exploration I want to do with this. And so definitely want to do more road tripping, find all the different hydrogen stations, learn about how they're used primarily in the passenger car space to understand how it can be used for larger applications. Yeah. Now, I know we, I always hear about how expensive hydrogen is and that when yeah. you buy in your eye, you technically get like $15,000 to spend on uh, like hydrogen refilling the car. Yes. So how much was... Did it cost to fill up your Mirai that you had for a few days? Yeah, like zero to full. I, and again, I don't know if we got like a cheap station or an expensive station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but based off your, 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 no, your real right. world experience. Where a lot of Mirai owners were going, by the way. So I don't think they were like jacking the prices up. Yeah. Uh, it was 80 bucks for a full charge. Okay. Full tank. So it's like That's filling up a Lexus gas. GX. Yeah and, yeah, and I was getting, you asked about range. We were seeing about 280, 290, but I was doing 85, 90 plus allegedly. Yeah. It only does 96 miles an hour. It won't even hit 100. Wow. Oh, <laughs> maybe I'm getting that confused. Maybe that's the buzz forks. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I, think, I, no, I think you, I think when you called me, you were telling me it did the Prius top speed, 112. 112, allegedly. Yeah. All new Volvo top yeah. speed as well. In the owner's manual, you must have read that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I would say like beating the snot out of it, driving it normally, you get 300 miles. And here's the main benefit I found for the passenger car space, really the only benefit over a battery electric vehicle, because with a battery electric vehicle, you charge it home and that's its main benefit is with a BEV, especially a BZ4X to compare to, it can take a very long time to do a 100% charge at a DC fast charger. And many people only have access uh, in LA, especially to public DC charging infrastructure, uh, instead of being able to charge up at their apartment with a hydrogen car, you just go boom, hundred percent drive away. Yeah. With an EV, you could go boom, 50% drive away, but you can't, no EV can go boom, hundred percent drive away, except for like an e-tron. <laughs> Fat e-tron. Not yeah, Tycon's pretty <laughs> close to that too. Uh, Tycon's pretty good, but it's still it's 50 fine. minutes, zero to full in a Tycon. Yeah, but it's also like 25 minutes, zero to 85, 90 though. Right. Yeah, but we're talking zero to full. We're talking okay, zero but, to yeah, full. Yeah, okay. I'll give you that. Yeah, that I'm last, just saying, the last 10%, you're right, is always a challenge. Yeah, which is not any issue for hydrogen. That's interesting. So yeah, That's hydrogen. So like I want a hydrogen station in Raleigh. I want to own one. I just want to drive it's, one for a week. It's cool. Yeah. So Mike, <laughs> what you should do is we should call up Toyota. You should come out to LA next time, whatever. And, or if we get one here, you should just come and spend Oh, some for time. sure. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't think I could ever recommend anyone to buy a hydrogen passenger vehicle, but I think we need to understand the technology way more than we mm -hmm. do. And we're super lucky because our office here in Colorado, Colorado State University, this is sort of becoming a hydrogen hub, our building where they're working on hydrogen combustion um, and they're working on hydrogen fuel cell and a whole bunch of other really interesting technologies. And everyone in this building is way smarter than I am about everything. So it's a great place to be for me because I can learn. The That's only awesome. downside I'm seeing to um, hydrogen vehicle ownership is just like similar to owning a, a electric vehicle is when you talk to uh, someone with a thick Southern accent driving a lifted truck, they were like, I heard those caught fire. Right. Just like with, it applies to Hindenburg, applies to Tesla, yeah. whatever it is, you know. It's like, aren't you worried just going to do the Hindenburg thing? You're going to have to sit and deal with that every every. I time. mean, I would just, it makes a good YouTube video if it blows up. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that, where is the tank located? It's got to be in a pretty safe spot, right? Is it like There's behind your receipt tanks. or frame or? Oh, okay. There's one that goes down the entire center of the car. Like there's one drive shaft area, right? Yep, there's one yeah. below the rear seats and there's one in the underfloor storage area of the trunk. Huh. And they're carbon oh. reinforced. They right, call the one in the back of the Pinto tank. They have like a metal exoskeleton to prevent against abrasion. And then you have your main CFRP core and then you have like this inner liner. Wow. Oh, so it's like a Polestar 1. <laughs> it's a little bit like a full <laughs> uh, but also they have like a lifespan to the tanks oh yeah just like scuba oh. tanks do and other and, i don't uh, know what the lifespan is but eventually that car is going to be worth nothing yeah i mean but that's interesting i don't know let me look it up how much what is the lifespan 
Is it if it's like thirty years? Sure, whatever. Although I mean, I've got cars that are thirty years old. I mean, it's a Toyota. I hope it's like thirty years. Uh, Could be. Could be ten. How much does it cost? Everyone talks about how much does it take to fill up. (laughs) Nobody's Uh, owned one long enough to find out. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder if Toyota's ever replaced a tank. An aluminum scuba tank has a life of twenty years. So this, oh, this is probably, kind of long. that's the maximum. Uh, you really 10 to 15 is what people talk about. Now let's see. Um, I didn't been to fuel tank. Um, oh, 10 years. What? <laughs> For the that's listeners. Not- sorry. We're doing a bunch of research right now. Trying to figure <laughs> out the answer to this question. <laughs> I'm sure there's like everyone within spitting yeah, distance of me knows up. the answer to this. <clears throat> yeah, there's someone right next to you. Say, like, you can probably figure it out locally. Yeah, but the problem is I don't really know anyone here, and I have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I most have to products are so. This is a compositesworld.com. Most products are certified for 55,000 cycles. Uh, that means they're certified for about 15 to 30 years, depending on their usage. I imagine in a car. Okay. Because it's a more extreme. Yeah, scenario. I'll never own a car so for that long. Years. Years. I don't know. Got a 1992 Ranger seems, out there that still runs. So basically, it's not as bad as everyone told me it was going to be, based off of my one experience. Now, next time we go, we might encounter only empty stations and big lines and issues and this. But I would say the car is unbelievably solid the integration of the hybrid system is great the fueling process was nothing but seamless in our experience this one time although that is the pain point that i hear from everyone i've just yet to experience it and um the efficiency of hydrogen is low the main benefit is quick refueling times Mm -hmm. and also not carrying around so much weight and so for me ambulances who knows yeah, well, so you could Please. blow up on the way to the. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just end it well, all. If you had a broken leg and all of a sudden you're a red mist, it'd be yeah. no problem. Yeah, you don't have to worry about your broken leg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pain over. So yeah, I mean, early days for sure, but but you know, didn't didn't really fear for my safety at all. The car felt no. so solid. Um, yeah. All right. So that's a lot of Mirai and BZ4X talk. But yeah, that's a good first deep dive on it, honestly. Yeah. Well, um, can I bring like a, a, a completely random bit of weird car trivia into this? Discussion? Yes. yes. I recently learned uh, that How did you there learn is that? <laughs> the <world's laughs> weirdest Google rabbit hole. I don't even know how I got to where I was. Because um, I, okay. I don't so, even know what he's about to say. Really? I recently <laughs> no, saw on the road a uh, Nissan Murano hybrid. And I was like, I didn't think they did that. I thought someone just stuck a badge on one and was lying. And I looked it up. And sure enough, a Nissan Murano hybrid exists. Very weird. I mean, Did they make it in cross cabriolet form? That was my I first question. Think so. That would have been <laughs> the one to own for sure because the most incredible thing is it's a supercharged four-cylinder hybrid. That's just what? the weirdest I engine. Can, yes, yeah, it's the weirdest engine I configuration. I Where they think source of. that like engine from? Their all-wheel drive hybrid in a Murano from themselves. It's like, not used wow. in anything. <laughs> like, that's that's <laughs> a, a previous Nissan weird spending thing before their new. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a Goshen thing, isn't it? Yeah. Now, no. <laughs> here's the crazy thing. Right now, you can go buy one for twenty six thousand dollars at. Comrade. That sounds like a lot of money. Yeah, it seems. Well, expensive. it has eighty thousand miles, so yes. Yeah, that's. It sounds uh, like even worse value. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, for a car that I've never heard of. Am I correct in saying this might be okay? Volvo does a supercharged hybrid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Nissan. Who That's else? It, right? I, there's got to be some. <laughs> I don't know anyone else who's supercharging their hybrids. I I, <laughs> I, 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 I got to think that's it. It's well, a rare breed of vehicle, right there. Two hundred fifty horsepower, in my bet. Before that. we go into discussing some ADAS, I have some trivia to add on to your trivia. Oh, what yes. <laughs> was the first automobile that incorporated adaptive cruise control? Uh, wait, say that again. Sorry, I have a class. Was it a was it in America? Are you talking about in America or like in the world? It doesn't say, so I'm guessing the world. Uh, (laughs) Wait, what what was your question? 
the first automobile equipped with adaptive cruise control was is what? this a car sold in the u.s market no i don't think so i've oh, never seen uh, it that's why i was <laughs> oh because i was gonna guess the, the original like ls or the infinity q45 QX, yeah qx I was say q45 with the laser adaptive yes the laser it's for america with the can't work in roads just like phantom LiDAR. breaking ever my dad yes, owns if a leaf goes in front of a laser beam Okay, that's a car. <laughs> yeah. I, have, I have the answer for the world, but also the U.S. Okay. All right, uh, what's the world? I don't even know on that one. Mitsubishi Diamante. Oh, what? <laughs> that was super luxurious car, the Diamante. It really yeah. was. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. It, it was, was to compete with like an US, LS. Yeah, when did back that... when Mitsubishi had money, which they don't anymore. Yeah, so that was they nine many rallies at that point. Wait. Ben, do you remember like 10 years ago we went to a Mitsubishi dealer? I was thinking of this the other day. Can we talk about that experience? Wait, first, we'll talk about the Mitsubishi dealer experience because it's it's a world. It's a different world. But I want to know the U.S. car with adaptive cruise control now. A 1999 S-Class. Okay, okay, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And the Mitsubishi was 1995. Wow. wow. Is that big of a difference? I yeah. bet you that system is terrible. Was it radar-based or... <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure. Do they not say? Mitsubishi probably the, doesn't even know these days. Camera based. Yeah, like, I'd love yeah, to yeah. bring that to a Mitsubishi dealer. I'm like, can you fix my adaptive cruise control? <laughs> 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 That'd be great. Yeah, um, so we went to a Mitsubishi dealer, and it looked like they had gone out of business. I think inside there was literally a TV on the ground, like a giant CRT <laughs> TV. <for the laughs> yeah. Like when you it walked into the showroom, that. right? It was playing yeah. like old VHS. Yes, Mitsubishi ads. VHS, Mitsubishi ads. Yes. On was, CRT. And oh, we did have like Mitsubishi 3000 GTs. No, no, they, they had like relatively like current, but on VHS. Yeah. Oh, like a, a Like the series. Outlander was on it, I think. <laughs> yes. Um, and the Eclipse was still on there. Yeah, like the third, the last gen Eclipse. This was like ever, when but. the Mirai, no, if, Mirage. Mirage. The Mirage got it. It was brand new. Right when it was, we rushed to a Mitsubishi like dealer to see the brand new, newly released Mitsubishi Mirage. So, <laughs> I think it's a joke. But yes. we're both equally excited to see it still. Well, because we had never driven a three-cylinder engine up until yeah, that. Point. That's, that's what it was. true. It was that was like the first three-cylinder in the U.S. Probably even. Yeah. So the the Diamante, it was called Preview Distance Control, and oh, it was light, lidar be. based. And it was Ooh. it controlled your speed by throttle control and downshifting, not with brakes. Right, a lot of early <laughs> systems didn't yeah. use brakes. Yep. Uh -huh. That makes yep. sense. Very cool. But nine eleven, we... I had did all cruise control speed via gear changes. So if you went down a hill, it would jump down yeah. the gears. Yeah, still dumb. <laughs> but it's we on a previous bad. podcast we introduced the hogback trials or challenges. But we've been running a lot of cars through that. What are we up to five now? Um, and more to come, but there's a lot of variety in the, um, I guess <laughs> the, the end result, but we started with the, the, yeah, the golf R, which was, so yeah, the first podcast we talked about this, we hadn't even run it yet. We just had conceptualized it. So mm -hmm. we started with the golf R did really well manual with lane centering, adaptive cruise control, the whole bunch. It, it even showed other cars on the screen and the driver's gauge cluster, like do you want to explain what the challenge is? Yeah. So the challenge, uh, it starts at Dakota Hogback, which is the base, the entrance to the Rockies at I-70. The Woolly Mammoth parking lot. Yeah. In the Woolly Mammoth parking lot name. at the Dakota Hogback. There's a lot of dinosaur fossils found in the area. So that's why there's a lot Love of it. Uh, I want to go. Yeah. And it's a Hogback is actually a geological term for uh, like kind of thin, rocky strips mm -hmm. of mountain kind of thing. So um, we start that and take it up basically 50 curves and um 30 miles round trip um i did like kyle's uh reaction to a i guess inside evs wrote an article on our porsche one and got like everything wrong um but yeah. <laughs> we yeah test everything on a series of curves and it's pretty intense and the we have a points system that we're still you know refining and tweaking but um seems to work pretty well so far at least as a good judge of how each car compares to each other, regardless of the points, we can actually pit the cars up against each other and see how well they do. So we deduct points if we have to take over in some sort of like either emergency situation or if the car like just gives up its control 
Um, and it's even worse if it gives up the control without even telling us it's canceling cruise control. Um, mm -hmm. And there's points for things like, you know, capacitive steering wheel and eye uh, cameras Tracking. that read your eyes and make sure you're paying attention. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot, but we've run the Golf R and the uh, Porsche Taycan with Inno Drive and Active Lane Keep. And um, let's see, we've done HDA1 and the Hyundai Santa Cruz. And we're about to do Tesla and Mercedes. Um, so we've got a lot. Yeah. Which Mercedes? <laughs> GLS 450. Oh, it's a spicy a one, too. It's a 450, but it's AMG pack. With oh, the does, it have the, does it have the nice. 23s? Or Not 22s the monoblocks. I think it's 22s, but it's yeah. still six. Oh, uh, yes. The AMG package with Nightline or Night package, whatever it's called. AMG so line with have a bouncy suspension I... mode. Oh, I love mistake. that. I love the GLS. The new ones, I think, look so good. I think it the GLS is the great. best SUV on the market. Gas oh, I, I agree. I think whoever buys a Suburban is crazy. Uh, <laughs> brand new Range Rover would be my pick. I don't I like mean, the back end of a new Range Rover. <laughs> I don't can't care. Buy them if it's you want a Range Rover. <laughs> it's the most proper <laughs> SUV. This Mercedes looks good. Split split really do. You don't get a split tailgate in a GLS, do you? Yeah, but but think about like from an on road. I haven't driven the yep, new road. So I don't know. I okay. can use yeah, the tailgate exactly. on or off road. <laughs> 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 I, I'm not well, disagreeing, I'm Ben, that the Range Rover probably is a better SUV, but I think the Mercedes like is more. better overall. That and the, the engine <laughs> options are boring. Get the Mercedes. Yeah. Well, the, the engine great. options, but the mild hybrid, so unbelievably <laughs> refined. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, the I Lever just and Line Six is pretty decent, but the Mercedes well, one, I'm sure, is supercharged. Honestly, enough, but but what I think would be the, the top the lineup, we should do a Cayenne Range Rover GLS. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think the X5 isn't nice enough. Maybe X7, but still not nice enough in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I, you could throw the X7 in there, but it would probably not win <laughs> because I think modern BMWs is they've got a lot of they're plastic gear. Than they yeah, used to and be. they have like they a lot of steering bushing. I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah they're steering. They, really they don't drive with the presence they used to, and they don't feel like that. Either. And the Range Rover, I would imagine, because I loved the last generation, spent a lot of time in that amazingly stately experience. The Cayenne mm -hmm. shreds, and the GLS seems to be like kind of capable on dirt, but like great on the road, has the right image, and honestly, probably is my pick without. Mm -hmm. Knowing, but I haven't driven like a new baser Cayenne. I drove a GTS uh, mm -hmm. and really liked that, but I'd like to try like a base e hybrid. The situation. real thing I want to hear from you on the yeah. GLS is the second, I don't really care what third of the second row, how that feels because the last gen GLS, did I say Cayenne? I mean GLS, the last gen GLS, um, the second row in that felt like you were getting into a third world country by comparison to the front. Oh, Ben, Ben, I have spent probably a hundred or probably more than that, probably 350 miles in the backseat of about 10 different GLSs. Oh. <laughs> I've done the thorough and I've experienced the executive receipts, the executive executive <laughs> receipts and the base receipts. <laughs> because base every, receipts? Let me tell you what happens. Every Mercedes event that we go to and we're lucky we Mercedes and us have a great relationship. So we go to everything and they have a fleet of 50 GLSs that go around <laughs> to shuttle everyone and they're all the same cars and they're all gray and they all look identical on the outside but some of them have the nice rear seats most have the base one and i always try to find the one with the nice rear seats and take that one and <laughs> oh i'll take the next one i'm waiting on someone right. got executive seats yes. that's exactly how it goes i'm like oh you go right ahead go ahead um and they're all of them are wonderful but the executive seats are like a full lounge uh, oh, nice. And some of the guys they hire like absolutely shred. So when I was at the Alabama launch, we were in a GLS doing like 130 wide open, just shredding through traffic. I'm like, this dude gets it. And I don't know if he like was good at driving because I felt like we were almost going to crash a couple times. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, here, I'll show you. Like here's here's me in the back of a GLS cruising around. Look at all the cars at port that were just oh, built. Yeah. And the dude hauled. It was awesome. By the wow. way, they also just drive around GLE plug-in hybrid diesels all around Alabama. 
because that's where that's they parade. <laughs> yeah, but they don't <laughs> sell them here. That's awesome. Yeah, so because every GLE and GLS it's is so made weird. in Alabama, yeah. you'll see like a two liter plug in hybrid with with type two DC fast charging on it. <laughs> Isn't so, the Mybox built here too? The Mybox, everything. And that's the EQS crazy. SUV is built here. But the oh, GLB, yeah. that one, that's no. prestigious. They make it in Mexico. Oh, really? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it feels like it, unfortunately. Yeah, so that's you're not gonna one put, of the best. You're going to put the GLS through your test, through our the new ADAS testing here oh, this right. week. Yep. I want to see the we, honest back overlanding test of it. Yeah, so Zach's going to work on doing an overlanding test. Our, the problem is we've developed this hill climb challenge right as the trail closed for the year or the winter. Oh, that's good timing. <laughs> so I've tasked Zach with coming up with a translational torque vectoring challenge along with articulation. So sort of like a elephant step situation um, with an incline uh, to either create it or find it. And I've also tasked him with coming up with a hill climb challenge that we can use all year round. Mm-hmm. Because we that's need more overlanding videos. The feature of out of spec. You can use rollers, but that's not a great test of climbability no, either. I think it's well. So Tommy at TFL did the roller test. Have you guys seen those? Yeah, I know they've done a few of them. Yeah, like and I think that's limit. that's at least the best that the industry has right now. Yes. And so we want to do better. So we'll try and find a way to do better. Mm -hmm. And we can't use rollers because we don't want to copy them. So we'll find something. Yeah, yeah. you got to be a little different. Yeah, of course. Build I'd like to actually obstacle, build. Of course. I'd like to build like a, a twenty-five or thirty degree slope with split mu ice patches, like that fake ice stuff that you water oh, down. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, your friends at Magna might be able to supply you with one of those. Yeah, I know. So well, they that, have one. I don't know if they <laughs> should do that. Hill, no, but. they have. They have so much stuff, Ben. I know. <laughs> I want to just so, drive around their obstacle course, basically. Yeah, and and we're going to in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, By the no. way, we're also going to do the G-Wagon experience and drive one. Like, we're going to do the G-Wagon experience, and then we're going to do the G-Wagon experience, which is like the off-menu, uh, like, you know, Friends of yes. Magna thing, where we drive it to the secret top of the mountain on some gnarly trails. And I hear they I have a 6x6. So oh, yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> but I, I don't know if it'll be available. Oh, let me just say, the 4x4 four four squared, though, that is G-Wagon perfection. I agree. Love it. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. So yeah, a bit, we I'm going to have Zach work with Magna to develop the test because they're king of transfer case. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we want something challenging. Yeah. So challenging every vehicle. And oh, the Civic was really good in that test too, we should mention. Yeah. So we've been yeah, driving the new, it just went back, but we had the new 2022 Honda Civic and mixed opinions around the office. Yeah. Really? I've heard yeah. only good things about it. To be I think it's the best car on sale for under $30,000. I think it's truly amazing. I agree. If you can and find it has, for that. Yeah. Well, this one was a limp, a maxed out, whatever they call it. I can't even remember. Touring. Sport touring. And yeah. Sport touring. It looks stellar. It has an amazing dash that's like more intricate than anything I've ever seen. On Very any cool airments. Yeah. Yep. And it, it handles so well. The CVT is honestly pretty good. Um, it kind of doesn't, it, it simulates gear shifts, but it's pleasant. It's a turbocharged engine, which helps at altitude, um, but it's very laggy off the line. That was my only complaint about the entire car. Was, That's, I honestly, think, the thing of their Honda, of Honda CVTs, because I've seen one on one of the inspection lifts at like a quick loop place. You yeah. get pushed over the small little like wheel chunk. Yeah. You know, it's like two inches high because from zero, it just doesn't want to engage. Right. But, you know, so Toyota's CVTs use a physical gear for yep, first, first gear yeah. and then switch to CVT. This, I think they're just trying to prolong the chains or clutches or whatever they use in there. I don't think it's belt driven. I think it's chain driven or metal of mm -hmm. some kind. Um, but, but truly stellar vehicle. I thought it handled so well. Um, started right up every time like every car should <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> that's, a, high well, that's a very set. high bar to set for a brand new car <laughs> and it just felt like it would do it forever like it just yeah and and, the, and as jordan was saying smoked our driver assistance test did a great job 
It's yep. the new benchmark. Because if a Civic can do it, your piece of shit hundred thousand dollar car should be able to do it too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah the I GLS don't know. better. Who own a hundred thousand dollar car that doesn't have any driver's assistance on it? Yeah, that would this be really crazy. crazy. So I'm I'm excited to do. <laughs> the G- I'm excited to try the GLS, and also, I mean. Everyone thinks of, oh, Tesla, autopilot, best thing ever. We're going to run the Tesla, both the radar, but also camera only cars. Yep. And so, a FSD beta car as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lots and we of might Model have to 3. break out the extreme challenge. Yes. Which I have is done. Is that where partially. you start throwing cones out of a car? And <laughs> like there's, yeah, there's, this road. could be interesting. There, yeah, there's there's a truck in front of you that drops mannequins. And <laughs> <laughs> you just throw beach balls at it or something and see what happens. No, there's another road just north um, that does the same effective thing, entering Wait, you into just, the mountains. Oh yeah, just north. Yeah, uh, Highway Six, which is also called, oh, what's it called? Um, is that yeah, a good name? Yeah, uh, highway. Uh, the Grand Army, <laughs> Grand Army of the Republic Highway, is this other cool official name. official name that's on Google cool. Maps? Yeah. So, um, that's the that's our extreme challenge. If a car can, you know, do the hogback challenge really well, we'll take it there and see how it does. Well, we which, wanted course, to with Rivian, but then but, like it needed to be pre mapped. Pre mapped is so dumb. Oh, it's like Super Cruise. Yeah. Yeah. It's dumb. But, yeah. yeah, that's a little dumb. No, anyway, really I, I, I'm not a fan of mapped systems. No, me either. Yeah. Okay. But, so yeah. what else have we been driving? We got anything else, Jordan? Um, I mean, the Santa Cruz. Did we was talk awesome. about what well, we told, we were going to talk about translational torque vectoring with the Rivian. Oh, we haven't yeah. even talked about that yet. Oh yeah. Did some off, <laughs> I do want to hear about that. I know, yeah. I know we're a little over an hour, but let's keep going. It's a yeah. free show. No one's paying yeah. to watch this thing. <laughs> no one's watching anyway. Yeah. We'll have to dock all you listeners 30 minutes on the next one to make up for it. So the next one will be short. No, yeah, I say longer the better. Let it rock and roll. Yep. Yeah. So, so I, yeah. I, I watched your, your test with Rivian, and my biggest fear was sort of realized, which is that when you have quad motors, which theoretically should be the ultimate in off-road wheel control, it looked like a lot of time wheels would kind of spin and the wheels that had grip weren't just getting that getting that shove they needed. Yeah, I think the powertrain control is definitely in its infancy with Rivian right now. The only way they can go is up. Let's just say it that way. It's amazing for like 99% of driving. Right. I don't think anyone's gonna really run into these issues. But as soon yeah, as we're you start hardcore off-road, right? Right. As soon as you start wheeling it. Like, I mean, like getting wheels up in the air and everything. It has to do basically differential locking simulated. We call it a virtual locker to apply power to the wheel that is not spinning. So situation, wheel in the air. I have a video on Twitter of it basically getting stuck. Wheel in the air, right? So front wheels in the air, front right, back left. Mm -hmm. There's only, you know, sort of diagonal axis wheels have torque which means it needs to not only do a front rear split, that's easy, it's got motors everywhere, it needs to also do a adjustment, um, you know, left, right. And so what was happening was the Rivian knew that the wheels were spinning because it wasn't just putting a million miles an hour on the wheel that's in the air, it was slowing Mm -hmm. them down. And you could hear it applying torque to the wheels that had the traction, but it wasn't applying enough torque to get it up over the hump. Now, the driver does play a role here, and I don't think Will was going wide open throttle. Mm-hmm. On the flip side, Will's used to driving a torque, or, sorry, a fully locked differential off-road vehicle, where if a wheel is in the air spinning, all of that excess torque that would have gone to that wheel is now actually mechanically transferred to the wheel with torque. Mm-hmm. So you only need a tiny bit of throttle to actually walk your way up stuff. And so the Rivian does require a little bit of a different driving style and a little bit of a counterintuitive driving style to mechanical lockers where you got to just mat the throttle or, or, you know, go deep and say, you know, that motor needs more current than I'm putting in with my foot. I'm going to go hard throttle. And, you know, whether that's the correct strategy or not, I'm not sure. The big question to me, though, is even if it could do all those obstacles and do everything, is virtual locking differentials the answer or is having a two motor system with a physical locker inside of the gear train of that electric motor the answer yeah being able to tie left and right physically together so you can use the torque of both of those motors even and still apply to one side if needed 
Right. So I've now driven two electric S or pickup trucks that have independent rear motors, at least. So Hummer EV and Rivian R1T, both off road and both virtual locking systems sucked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is, like, it, it seems to perform the way a traditional car SUV all-wheel drive system does, where it's using brakes to grab stuff. But instead of having, it's not having these brakes to grab stuff to shift power, but the end result of how you drive it and what it looks like on the outside, as far as power going to where it needs to go, is kind of the same. And I felt like yep. I was drinking the Rivian Kool Aid for a, a hot minute there. I'm like, it's you know, it's individual control. It's so great, like. You don't need differentials. You don't need any of this. And now I'm looking at it. I'm like, it would be so much better if it had differentials all of a sudden. So, so there's two ways to fix. Yeah. So, so I guess my main issue with it is not the rock crawling thing. I'm not afraid of putting the pedal to the metal, right. And climbing mm -hmm. up stuff. That's not ever been my issue. My issue is because I had the Rivian in Moab and it did okay, but really where it was annoying was in the, in the slush and dirt and mud. And I was by myself on top of a mountain range, very far away from everyone and uh, basically needed the reassurance of locking differentials. And what would happen is, is when I'd go into the throttle, I knew that the wheels on the snow were spinning and I was digging in. And the wheels that had the traction on the right side of the car, because I was on a split mu surface, weren't helping me move along unless I just stayed in it, waited, waited, waited. And I had to use the momentum of the truck to keep it moving along versus with a locker, uh, the car wouldn't have to go, oh my God, that wheel's spinning. Let me apply torque here. And however quick you do that, there's pretty much no way around that wheel spinning. Let me put power here. Now there's other factors they could use which is that suspensions under compression or you know mm -hmm. maybe camera to gauge what kind of surface you're on but it's never going to be as just locked in as a mechanical locker no matter how you do it and that leads to some uneasiness and honestly questionable driving it leads to i'm not sure what's going to happen when i put my foot down but like i'm on the edge of a cliff so i have to put my foot down let's just hope the truck can figure it it's out it's not as predictable and in the situation you described where you have two wheels on a soft surface two wheels on a, a, a surface where you have that traction the last thing you want to do when you're in a tricky spot is dig yourself a hole but you kind of have to resign to letting that one side dig a little deeper for the other side to pick up the slack yep. and move you forward and it's a question of will i get dug too deep before the car figures that out or increases torque on that outside motor Right. And so it comes down to software improvements where they're doing maybe, you know, this will get adapted over time. But what it really comes down to is I think the Rivian dual motor, hopefully it has front and rear lockers, is going to be the solution. That could be a better off-roading vehicle. That's what I was hoping. Yeah. The dual motor would be the one with the actual locker. Yeah, Even so if the Hummer, Rivian doesn't do it, it's going to have a differential which will make it easier for someone to configure their own lock. Four. Yeah, so the Hummer EV has a has a mechanical front diff locking, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was really nice. Um, and and the the rear Hummer EV needed like almost a full rotation, maybe two, to like start being like, oh my god, let me put some power here. Yeah. And the Rivian's worse. The Rivian will just sit there all day spinning, 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 because even though it knows you're applying throttle, it, you actually have to apply like way deeper throttle than normal to get whatever current the other motors were going to have up because it's not saying you're giving me 25% throttle. I'm going to give 25% of your power to the two motors that have traction, which would be 50% yeah. each. It's going to say, Oh, you're only giving 25% throttle. So I'm only going to give that motor 25% of what it can do. Mm -hmm. and if it's really doing a virtual locker. It needs to then up that power higher than your input would normally be to that motor. Exactly, yeah, because it's saying now each motor is at 25% power level. Right. But that might, the left one might need 30 to actually get you over the obstacle. But since it's right. not at 30, everything's just going to spin. Right. And at least with a brake torque vectoring system, the throttle input that you are going, you know, at least, you know, your 25% throttle application is going to that axle. Yeah, and it's, the Rivian, it's, it's just like you have to drive it differently. And again, I wasn't wheeling the Rivian. We're going to do standardized testing on this stuff because our mm -hmm. audience was actually annoyed with us on that video because we were just out having a good day and we didn't like engineering break everything down. And guess, guess what? I totally agree. And so we need to we need to do a better job of of benchmarking these things and explaining these things and honestly being the go to 
uh, torque vectoring, locking differential source on mm -hmm. the internet. I really like to see as a comparison, if you can, if you can get a defender with the Rivian together to yep. see here's the best of a traditional system, even without physical lockers, you know, because not all defenders yep. have that. The one here's you're what on the best is not. Yeah, here's what the best brake based system can do versus the quad motor system. Because I was looking at like the GX, which is, I don't know what time is this, 2005, 2004, yeah, something four, like yeah. that. And it was delivering more, you know, traditionally, I guess, predictable performance on those. It would get a half a wheel spin and go lock power somewhere else. Yeah. It's really I mean, it is driving differently. It's, you know, just as if it was a different type of transmission, you have to learn to drive differently. I guess there's that argument to be made too, but at the same time with all the software control, maybe they can then try and just like make up for those differences to make it a little more comfortable to offer. For a lot of it can be adapted through software and improved. There's a lot of headroom there. Yeah. The truck can be amazing with what it has with hardware, um, but it really could never be as good as a physical locker, no matter what you do. That's true. So four I'm motors, working. worse than two motors in almost any scenario, actually, I'm learning. Because even with drifting, if you want to overpower the outside, but you're already at full power, the motor can't give you any more. But if you had a mechanical sure. locker, you could still send more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's counterintuitive. So the yeah, real like answer is actually just as we reduce motors, one motor. <laughs> back to square one. Back, back to just front motor, rear wheel drive. That's it. <laughs> then to drive the on road performance, you know, this this, this whole <laughs> makes sense. I think for how people use the Rivian, that setup is really good, though. It's I don't know just, what benefit the four motors give you in daily driving. That's true, because like the torque vectoring stuff doesn't really matter in a pickup truck at the end. Of the day. It handles amazing, but the two motors probably. Handle. Or you could just put a mechanical torque vectoring on the rear, like Magna does our sponsor of today's episode. Not, this isn't because we're sponsored. I'm just saying, why not have one motor with, with two clutch packs? Mm -hmm. It's a good point, actually. I don't I know. Think I think it's a mechanical simplicity it. idea in multiple motors is, is how it, it feels on the offset, even if it's- I think it, it sounds way cooler than the actual benefit you get. Mm -hmm. And more points of failure, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, enough about the Rivian, but but still pretty good off-road. Great suspension system, at least. Yeah. The, the yeah, air sure. compressor in the Rivian feels a bit weak. I noticed this. when you guys were off-roading it, he had come over an obstacle, and then the right rear suspension stayed tucked for quite a while. It take, And the, the compressor just runs and runs and runs and runs, and then yeah. eventually it will overheat. Wow. Oh, that's oh. everyone's favorite. I, I've been in vehicles and overheated air suspension compressors. I can tell you off-road it's not ideal. Right. Yeah. Well, the Rivian, the Rivian overheated on me twice in very high suspension and locked me at 20 miles an hour and wouldn't even purge the system so I could go above 20. I had to wait there. Uh, oh. So there'll so, be the, the Rivian accessories market, a compressor cooling mods are going to be the thing. Yeah. They're young. They'll figure ice it out eventually. Yeah. <laughs> ice packs. Yeah, there's uh, just like thermals in general in the Rivian with charging and stuff. We should get into another time. Definitely, definitely weird because we've also done a a battery uh, 500 amp charging story on the Rivian, and yep. and amazing that it can do 500 amps now. Should have done that out of the gate, but now it does. Does 217 kilowatt peak charging rate? It really can't do any more than that physically yep. on a public CCS charger because they're limited to 500 amps. Mm -hmm. Their adventure network they could go higher but they really need to work on their cooling because they kept hitting thermal limits while charging. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yep. Still want one though. <laughs> yeah. It's still the best vehicle on the planet. <laughs> I don't feel so bad about like writing off the quad motor now, truthfully. I think, I think the, the dual, dual motor is going to be the move. Appealing. The big question yeah. is, are they going to put lockers front and rear? Are they going to make it hard? Uh, you can add them if you really need them. On an electric motor? Yeah, you've got a diff differential still. It's not like we got a Magna there. sponsor. <laughs> yep. Anything's possible it out. on Magna's dime. That's right. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> Magna, we're going to drop this truck off for you. Do a little video. Just let us know when it's done. And then we'd be done in like What's three in it days. for you? A YouTube video. Of course, that's worth yeah. the development cost. <laughs> yeah. They had a Rivian there benchmarking uh, when uh, Timon and I were up. Oh, there. I'm not surprised. Yeah. 
and they because Bosch did the motors and uh, they were just, I guess, reverse engineering or just benchmarking it, seeing how it does. And they basically said the same stuff we did, which is like, whoa, left, right, translational torque vectoring, just not great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much pretty much what we've been up to. I think we'll wrap it up there. But um, yeah, check out all these videos out of spec various channels we have out of spec overlanding we're really ramping up zach's doing an awesome job and um out of spec reviews of course daily where... videos on out of spec reviews yeah and a lot of these new adas ones which a lot of people are finding interesting so not we many are... people though they're not hitting big numbers yeah well it's young no one's it's found a highly any... specific video it might be yeah. hey i'm looking at this car let's see how it does on the out it is but no one's a really useful video though. if we no were doing, really doing it well, if we were doing two videos a week, I'd say let's not waste our time. But since we do yeah. seven, we can take a hit once in a while and come out of it. Yep. <laughs> yep. Seven on that one channel. We do a lot more than that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> By well, the way, anyway. plenty to come. We have the race to Vegas going up next week. Part three, nice. Rivian road trip going up this week. Everything's rocking. Yep. Awesome. I'm excited to watch both of those. Well, we'll see you on the next episode very soon. <laughs>